thank you again, everybody, for joining us tonight. I'm Lisa Levine. I'm the Senior Director of Programs for Dementia Alliance of North Carolina, and I'm thrilled to be back. It's been a little while since we've done a Q&A, and I've missed our chats with Melanie online. I know she's been teaching some new support group facilitators how to do that this morning, so she's been busy. Um, we are talking tonight about tips and suggestions to make your world more dementia friendly. Um, that might be in your home or outside of your home. And we do have a couple of sponsors to help us provide the session for free. So I want to thank them. Um, ASI, Acadia, and Kent Thompson Capital Financial Solutions. Those three organizations have helped us uh, do this tonight. So we thank them. And I thank all of you for taking the time out this evening or afternoon, depending on where you are. Um, and Melanie, I'm just gonna let you jump in. There's so much to talk about tonight. So we'll let you just start off. Yeah, there really is because um, even without questions, I could probably talk about four hours um, uh, for thinking about making the world a better place for people living with dementia. And we could talk about all kinds of, of different things. Um, but I did look at the questions that y'all sent to, to Lisa and I am gonna try to weave some of those in as we go through some of the thoughts that I have. Um, but it is supposed to be a question and answer. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna start seeing if y'all wanna start if you want me to start. Because if y'all wanna start, I would be glad to spend the next 54 minutes with you um, just answering questions about how to make the world uh, more dementia friendly. I'd be glad, glad, glad to do that. Or I have a backup if you, um, if y'all want me to start instead of y'all starting. So what are your questions? or what are your thoughts about what you, you want to talk about today? Does anybody want to start with one of the, the things they put in the chat maybe? Mm -hmm. That's a highlight of the and 25 cases. I'll, I'll start, Melanie. Thanks, Jill. I have, I work with a hospice and I have a caregiver right now and, and both of her parents have vascular mm -hmm. and her dad has vascular and advanced cancer. He's the one on hospice. And the family's really worried about how mom's going to do after he passes. Mm -hmm. And um, I've kind of given him some of my, my pack teachings and all. How, how do you... How, uh, and, and my aunt had vascular and my uncle died and she she did well she really didn't ask about him or anything mm -hmm. so what would you suggest so your your question is you've got you're working with a, a couple mm -hmm. um they both have vascular dementia you're anticipating that one of them is is farther along in the disease process or has other complicated medical cotton problems that are really often associated with vascular dementia he has a, he has a cancer and the cancer is going to take him is what's taken. Okay, I'm sorry if I missed that part. So he he has cancer and that's why he's in hospice. So they're kind of wondering how do we support mom through this? Yes, yes. Because losing your spouse and your partner really doesn't make the world feel like a friendly place, right? Right. So that can make the world feel very complicated and friendly. So let's let's talk a little bit broadly, and then we 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 might get back a little bit more specifically. So I I actually have an article. I don't know if you can find it, Lisa, um, but I wrote an article a while ago called "Sharing Bad News" or something like that, hmm. and it kind of it talked about that whole idea of of what do we tell, who do we tell, when do we tell, and why do we tell. Mm -hmm. um, when there's something that's bad news. And so the, 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 when, what do we tell is really dependent on, what do you think the, what we tell the person might be dependent on? And I'm opening up that to the whole group. What do you think what we tell the person might depend on? What they can understand. Exactly. So what they can understand. So where they are in dementia so what that person can understand so for example if someone is really early in dementia they might really get what's happening they might have questions they might want to know stuff if someone is in a different place in their dementia um it, it might not they might not be able to process that to hold on to it 
something. Mm -hmm. So where are, where is that person in the dementia? I might also think about things like, and um, like, um, um, how much time do they spend together with them being in hospice uh, my assumption is but i don't know this that they're they're living in the same home yes yes so i might really need to deal with it address it differently for somebody who sees that person all day every day mm -hmm. compared to somebody when they live separately mm -hmm. so i'm, I'm going to think about those kinds of things as well so um i'm also going to think about um the people people living with dementia um notice what's going on in the environment so i'm gonna um i'm gonna uh, i don't have that pulled up so if if um if lisa is my my mom and and she walks in oh my what, what are you what are you gonna say lisa Melanie, what's wrong? No, mm -hmm. Nothing's wrong, Mom. It's fine. No, no, something. You're crying. You're sad. Oh, what's it's, wrong? It's okay. Nothing's wrong. We're all fine. Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to time myself out. So what happened in that interaction? What did you notice? Can I ask an open-ended question? So, so that's a big question. Yeah. So Lisa's my, my, my mom, I'm her daughter. Mm -hmm. when, when I, as the daughter was distressed, what did mom notice? That you were sad. She know, and our mom's probably going to pick up on that. Oh yeah. 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 And most human beings are going to pick up on that. Cause all of y'all picked up on it. We're going, Oh no, is she really okay? Um, and so that's part of the world is the environment is the people in the world. And so if family is around and family is going to be grieving and family is going to be um, um, struggling, that person living with dementia, mm -hmm. do you think they're likely to be aware that something is different or not? Oh, yeah. Yeah, mm -hmm. she's, she's going to... And was could the vascular really cause the depression to really crank up for for mom? Yeah, yeah. Well, people with vascular dementia have a high risk of depression anyway. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, and and I want to be careful about something. Um, we should maybe do something about this sometime, Lisa. Um, and we may have already, but there's a big difference between grief and depression. Mm -hmm. And we sometimes assume if someone is sad, they're depressed. Mm -hmm. And if somebody with dementia is sad, they're depressed. And the reality is people living with dementia can be sad and grieve. And we, we don't, we support them through sadness and grief and loss, just like we support another human being through sadness and grief and loss, which is, is validating, supporting, tell me, you know, I'm really sad too. tell me. And then we can, you know, looks like you're really sad. Tell me about what you're, there's a three-step thing, the empathetic community. Looks like you're really sad. Tell me about what you're feeling or what you're remembering. Let's go do something. Let's go look at a picture. Let's go make a donation. Let's go um, make this dessert that you can teach me how to do. So, so moving through those steps. So it's not all about talking. It's also about doing and moving and pictures. And yes. Yes. So what, what did you say, Margaret? I missed that. Distracting them from what they, you know, trying to get their attention and change the subject straight away, if you can. Well, and and I maybe, maybe not, because if 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 um if Lisa and I are friends, right. so Lisa and I are friends, where she's not my mom anymore, she's my friend. So if Lisa and I are friends and I'm upset, what do I what do I expect Lisa to do? All right, show, show consideration. <laughs> I expect Lisa to support me and to validate me. If we, if I walk in, or Lisa, can you be sad? So if, if I walk in and Lisa's sad and I say, oh, Lisa, let's go shopping. <laughs> right. <laughs> she, she's kind of, that's not the, she's not got the shopping vibe, right? No. <laughs> and, and so that's not going to work. And so, yes. So after you validate, after you hear the story, then we can layer into yeah. something with it. Yeah, mm -hmm. absolutely. Was that helpful, Jill? Very much. Yes. Thank you so much.
Good. And, and that, that, um, that article, you probably can find it. It's been shared a couple of different places on other people's websites and things, but it's, if you Google or you search my name and sharing, um, bad news, mm -hmm. you probably can find it. Oh, um, Neva, are you, oh, bye Neva. She's gone. <laughs> So I hope she'll send us her question. So what other questions do you have? So Melanie, just for one sec, I will uh, find that and I will send it in the follow-up email to everybody. And I'm also going to put in the chat a link to a video we have on that empathetic communication that you just talked oh, about. Oh, great. Thank you. But I'll share that with everyone as well in the email. The other one that you might want to put in there, Lisa, is the one on ambiguous loss mm -hmm. because that's something that we're um is, is making a lot of sense with and for and about people living with much and their care partners um is that ambiguous loss piece so what's another question about making the world um a better place a more inclusive place a friendlier place for people living with dementia what's another question so Joe, are you asking a question? No, uh, can you hear me? I can hear you. Okay, great. I've never mm -hmm. used a computer with a, a video call. So the thing that, that got my attention for this uh, call was the title, Tips and Suggestions to Make Your World More Dementia Friendly. And so again, I go back to my father is the one who has dementia. My mom is a caregiver, but I live very close. So I'm you know, very involved in his care as well. And what I've noticed is, of course, his whole personality has changed, which is not uncommon, um, but his world just keeps getting smaller and smaller. So, you know, he has certain things they do. There's, <laughs> he's going to be 90 in September, but they still go to the gym every day, you know, so going to the gym, going to church, going to these things that he does on a routine basis, of course, is comfortable to him. But mom is still social. And although she's, you know, 86, I mean, she still wants to get out and do, it's made her world shrink. And so I worry more about her. There's nothing I can do about his, you know, situation, but she's the one I worry about. And so I can get her out for a couple hours at a time, but that's about all. Um, and so then in order to get her to have some time out, he also needs to be willing to go out, which he's not willing to do a whole lot anymore. And so I don't know, I'm sure, you know, that's very common and I'm guessing it's because it's so confusing and overwhelming to him, uh, you know, the world is, unless he's very, very um, familiar with things that he just doesn't want to go anymore. Um, but I just, I don't know if there's any tips or tricks, you know, to helping us like tomorrow, for instance, we're supposed to go to see a movie and we, ha we haven't taken him to see a movie um in a very very long time and so we don't know how it'll turn out but we're gonna go try um and so you know how can i navigate that you know with trying to help her keep her sanity even while he's hesitant to go out okay all right so what you're saying joe is you've got mom and dad dad has dementia and is 90 mom doesn't have dementia is 86 dad does stuff but it's it's a, a smaller world stuff. He he goes to the um he goes to church, he goes to the gym every day, and, and those things that are really familiar, but he's really happy and satisfied and really fine in this house where things are predictable and where things make sense and where he can kind of manage. Mom's world is kind of dad's world is kind of functionally smaller mom's world has really gotten artificially smaller right because mom really would like a um a bigger world so you you mentioned something about the two of them needing to go together tell me more about that he's very hesitant to let anyone else stay with him he, that's she's like his security blanket and so even me as close as we are or my sister you know, we do spend some time with him here and there, but he's has, a, I mean, he, he just, if she's going, she wants to go, but if he goes, it's not very pleasant for her. <laughs> so it's, okay. you know, it's kind of like a cycle. So if he, if, if, um, if she goes, he wants to go, but it's not a, a pleasurable, enjoyable experience for her. What kind of things have you tried? Um, you know, just, of course, just trying to get him to understand where we are and reasons why, which I know that's, you know, very difficult for him, of course. Mm -hmm. 
uh, just trying to keep him distracted, get him interested in something else. So, you know, a, 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 an example of this is not fun stuff, but she she has some eye appointments and different things that I take her to. And, you know, it's a two hour appointment and that's hard for him to sit in a, uh, you know, waiting area for two hours. And he gets kind of anxious and, you know, he says, I wonder if she went out another door. Does she still know we're here? That kind of thing. And, you know, I, you know, I answer as best I can and, 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 you know, try to walk them around and show them where everything is and make them feel comfortable. But I really don't know that I really have tools in my toolbox, you know, to, to, to really make him feel better uh, or get him to, you know, help him to understand mm -hmm. what's going on. So it kind of sounds like he's really not happy when he's away from home with her and he's not happy when he's at home in a familiar place with her. So which do you think might work better for him being unhappy at home or unhappy away from home? Oh, he's completely happy at home and he's completely happy with his daily, his routine kind of things. He's happy with that. Um, yeah. So yeah, he's, he's not an unhappy, you know, right. but I mean, I mean, when, when she's not there. Um, okay. So, okay. So let me frame the, let me frame the situation again. Okay. So you're asking me if she's not around and he is at the house when she's not there mm -hmm. and now tell me the question again. I'm so sorry. So if, if, if he, he, when, when he's out with her, mm -hmm. he's not happy. He, when, when, because, because he's in an unfamiliar place and right. he's waiting for her with these appointments. Right. And when he, when she leaves and he's at home without her, he's still not happy. Yes. When he's at home without her, he can and make it for a there. couple of hours. Um, but then after that, he gets very anxious. That's weather again, every day is going to be rain. Yeah. So sometimes what happens, Margaret, you're okay. Margaret, what we can do, we can, we can, yeah, you're good. It, it's complicated. These meetings at home are complicated. So, so let's think about, um, when when he's at home and he's in a comfortable place and mom isn't there, what kinds of things might he get involved with that might help that time go better or go faster? Or is there something different he could do? So maybe he's out riding around while she's in the appointment, or maybe he's um, so just to kind of of. Um, Think through some other things. What what kinds of things that, or do you think about, Joan? Um, well, I have asked him if when we're I'll use the appointments as a specific situation. I was like, well, let's go for a walk around the parking lot, you know, or let's go for a drive. And he's he's definitely not interested. <laughs> he mm -hmm. just he's not. Um, so I I haven't found you know, and and I'll you know try to find some things like you know I'll if if I have a magazine I'll read something to him you know oh listen to this you know such and such but mm -hmm. um, he just he's 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 just uh, sort of enduring it and he's you know as nice as he can be he's very very you know nice calm individual but he's just anxious he's I not guess. settled he's he's un he's unsettled when when the two of them aren't together because she she kind of is a thing that makes the world make sense yes yes and so when she's not there the world makes sense doesn't make sense mm -hmm. and so then we're, we're kind of thinking about what are some things that we can do for him to make the world make sense and so it might be um i i i I had one person that what we wound up doing that worked amazingly well, not promising this for everybody, but for this one family, what worked is um, for years and years and years, and some of y'all might be talking about, know what I'm talking about, for years and years and years, this woman always carried a black pocketbook. And she always had this black pocketbook. And so when she would go out, she would give her husband the black pocketbook. Hmm. And, and what did that mean to him? Well, I'm sure it represented some level of security for him. Uh, yeah, you know. it meant she was coming back because she always had her pocketbook. So there might be something like that that might um, kind of help make the world make more sense for him. Okay. Um, yeah. And, and we've done other things. I mean, there's so many other things. We um, Sometimes part of what we we the challenge that we get in, in any of these situations is we we depend on talking mm -hmm. to kind of make connections and provide support but what doesn't always go so well for people living with dementia yeah. 
the conversations and yeah. talking. And so sometimes if we have, so Margaret, do you want to unmute for me? I'd love to hear what you said. They hear, but in my case, in my husband's case, he hears, but he doesn't listen. He can't follow. Yeah. Okay. Exactly. It's so because yes, that's exactly what it's like. Mm -hmm. And so this idea that people um, might talk but not listen. So it's it's not that two way connection kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So in instead of relying on words and talking, maybe we think about um, trying some headphones and some music. Mm -hmm. You know, or maybe that we. Looks yeah, maybe we think about um, something to work with and and not not so much something Dad, could you help me with this while we're sitting here in this office or while we're sitting here in the car or while we're waiting for mom to get back from her appointment could could you help me with this? I really need your help with this. I'm not good at it. Mm -hmm. Or I've gotten really behind. Could you help me with this? And maybe it's it's um, folding bath cloths or maybe it's sanding something for a school project, or maybe it's anything that might have meaning for him. It doesn't, it doesn't really have to be, um, you can do sandpaper blocks. And, and I, because it's, I've had people spend hours doing sandpaper blocks. So that might be something else. You might not want to do that in the doctor's office. They might really like bill you a cleaning fee or something, but you never know what might happen. Would he do a jigsaw puzzle perhaps on his phone? Maybe so. Mine, mine does. Okay. So the, that's something else. So it's doing something, not mm -hmm. just talking. And it's kind of like um, it, it, when when I was pregnant, I had a go bag, you know, which had all the stuff I needed to take to the birthing center with me. And so you might want to think about what might make sense to go in a go bag for your dad. Hmm. That's a good idea. Yeah, I will give that some thought. Because mm -hmm. a, lo a, a lot of times it's the, when, it, when is the, the time you're least likely to be creative and flexible? When you're, when you're sitting there in the waiting room with your dad. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, that's not the time when it goes really well to come up with a good idea. Right. Or not for me anyway. You may be real different from me, but. Yeah. Well, and I may do some things. I may grab a... Um they're uh, UNC Chapel Hill graduates, both of them. And so he would still remembers that kind of thing. And he was in the Air Force. Maybe I'll try to grab some things related to that. Um, and maybe his time in the Air Force and such too, as well to go through. And Yeah, especially if it's something we can do. So maybe we've got um, pictures that need to be put in a, in a, mm -hmm. a scrapbook thing. If he's got that kind of fine motor, maybe it is um, um, I, uh, things that need to be sorted. So I, I had a family buy um, four, well, they bought six packages and that turned out to be too much, but um, packages of playing cards that have different bats on them and put them all in a basket and say, you know, we can't use these cards. They're all mixed up mm -hmm. and, and they would sort the cards by the back of the card. So it, it seemed productive. It seemed meaningful. Um, it, it was something a person could do and be successful. And it took a while. Right. Yeah, so, that's cool. a good idea. Cool. So what other, what other, was, did, was that help? Did we get you any, did, ah, did we get you anywhere, Joe? Yes, that, that's very helpful. Um, right. and, and I don't want to monopolize the time. So I, I'll let some others chime in. I have some other questions, but I'll just let some <laughs> Sure. And the other the other down. thing, so so that's a, a great point is um, we do have other resources. So we have support groups and support groups can be great places to go and get information. We've got um, two dementia navigators in the office who are um, really brilliant people to um, to call and and have conversation with them, problem solve and figure out figure out. Um, if you're in Durham County, I've got um, a Duke grant that allows me to do some consultations as well. So um, there, there, there are sources there and um, you can call support groups, um, other kinds of places too. So, so what other question? You're welcome. I don't think that he would want me to contact you if it's with a Duke grant though. I don't think that would be okay with him since he's a Carolina graduate. So here's the thing. I graduated from UNC in 1983. <laughs> so who did I go to college with? Oh, yeah. Jordan, Michael Jordan. I went to college with Michael Jordan. I also have degrees from Clemson and Duke. 
So here's my attitude. I let Duke pay me. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, um, and, and the Duke School of Nursing is, is wonderful. Um, um, so I, I really in, in, enjoy my work and I don't mind letting Duke pay me. That's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So what other um, questions? If not, I've got some pictures I can show you. So let me go to my thing, show you my pictures. Lisa might not pay me if I don't, um, if I don't show at least a few slides. Um, so I, I, I wanted to show you this picture. We're talking about making the world more dementia friendly. And this is kind of a typical looking bathroom, right? Mm -hmm. So, and it's clean mm -hmm. and it's not incredibly cluttered. So there's some good things about this bathroom. I don't want to beat up this bathroom at all. And what do you notice about this bathroom? Very white. It's very white and, and we tend to think of things being furniture and floors and rooms and things being white, being clean. But it also looks very what? Cold. Clinical. Mm -hmm. Clinical and cold. And it also looks, it's hard if you have, you know, if you kind of kind of squint your eyes a little bit, kind of maybe think that you've got some changes in your vision, would it be hard to figure out what's where? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so how hard would it be to get into that shower oh yeah because the shower is white the floor is white the curtain is white how hot, hard is it going to be to step over that thing so what could we do to make this bathroom more dementia friendly what could we do knowing that i mean if, if you've got an extra fifty thousand dollars <laughs> and, and you want to you know you want to redo the bathroom it would have been twenty thousand before covid but now everything's so much more expensive <laughs> in, in house construction and stuff like that if you if you wanted to do some simple cosmetic things to this room what could you do yes ma'am that's margaret I'll tell you what I did, and that didn't work for us. I had a cutout done by Home Depot in the bath, and they put a nice edging on the side so that he could just step in the bath without having to climb over the bath. Uh -huh. He won't use that. Then I bought a chair um, from United Healthcare through them. I bought a chair to put in the bath so that we could shower him when the time comes. Um, he had a nasty fall about a month ago, and... Um, I had to, we had to put a trash bag over his arm. It was in a cast. Uh -huh. He had stitches on his head, but um, he, he was forced, he refused to take a shower or a bath. So my daughter helped me. I put him in his trunk, swimming trunks, and we put him in the bath. And then I told him that we were going to get, uh, the doctor had arranged for us to get therapist, a, a therapy for him mm -hmm. and also um, a CNA that would come and help him bath. And when he heard those words, guess who was happy to go and bath on his own again uh, with me to help him wash his hair and such. But the thought of somebody else other than me or my daughter uh, uh, made him get in the bath. Well, and I'm, I'm glad that I'm glad you found an answer that that's a mm -hmm. I'm glad that worked. I wouldn't want somebody giving me a, a bath or a shower. So I can kind mm -hmm. of understand that. So so I'm, I'm thank you for telling some things that work as well as some things that didn't work. And going back to this bathroom, what do you think we could do that might make it a little more use a little friendlier looking? Melanie, maybe you could change the shower curtain. That's inexpensive no. to a solid color. That's a, concra a contrast. So maybe contrasting colors. Yeah. Maybe change the shower curtain so it's a contrast. What could we do to that toilet? Change the lid color and the seat color. Maybe change the lid and the seat color might work. Uh, maybe put a non-skid rug around it to kind of help it stand out a little bit more. It looks like there's a dark mat in front of it. It does. I can mm. kind of see that edge of the dark mat. So maybe we want to cut out the dark mat and put it up there where Around. we can the toilet. I love the idea of a seat cushion and a, and a cover with that as well. Mm. Um, the other thing that's worked really well for me with this kind of shower, this kind of tub or a classic kind of tub where you step in is a colored bath mat. Because I think a lot of times for people living with dementia, that stepping into that white feels like you're stepping into a hole or, mm -hmm. or you're stepping onto nothing. So something to step onto 
um, can, can really be helpful sometimes. Mm -hmm. And then something to step on, um, onto when you're getting out of the shower as well. So some things to make the bathroom more friendly might be some things like that. Mm -hmm. um, the next one I put up here is um, let's make the bedroom more friendly. So look at this, look at this bedroom. I, I personally love a canopy bed. I had a canopy bed as a little girl and I personally love a canopy bed. And if that's the bed you've slept on your whole life, that might work, right? Um, but what else might make this bedroom more dementia friendly? Say more contrast, bring colors. Again, more contrast, maybe, mm -hmm. you know, maybe have the pillows a different color. So the pillows look like they stand out. What, what else might help? Take off the top. Take off the, or I, I missed part of that. Take off the, that top part. But... Yeah. So, so maybe taking the canopy off. Yeah. Maybe, maybe taking off the canopy um, because the, the, the reason I chose this particular picture is I, I had a guy who always thought he went to stay with his daughter, canopy bed and the guest bedroom. He thought the ceiling was falling on him. Oh. And, and you can kind of see how it might sort of look like that. So maybe maybe the canopy makes people feel it's familiar. We like it. Maybe maybe not so much. What else might you try? Maybe those curtains, like some blinds to let more natural light in. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So I love that idea. Um, so because light is so important. Um, I, I read something um and I, I can't remember right now where it was, but I think I wrote it down. Um, that was talking, this is so interesting. I'm going to stop sharing actually. Um, that was so interesting. That was new to me. And it was talking about when our brains were developing, when our brains were evolving, um, our, our hormones were kind of staged, were kind of developed to get a, a rush of energy at the end of the day. And so what would happen is as the sun started to go down about four or five, six o'clock in the afternoon, maybe later, when the sun started to go to down, go down, our, our brains would get a rush of energy. And that's so you could, you know, finish the farming, you know, get the kids in from outside, get supper cooked, you know, so we kind of have that rush of adrenaline um, to get the work done that needs to be done before nighttime. So at, when the sun goes down, everybody's in, everybody's home, everybody's fine. Well, what happens now is the lights don't go out until we go to bed. So how many of y'all have had the experience like I have really often when I go to bed, I cut off the lights and I go to bed and my, I get energized. Does anybody else have that happen? Oh, you know, yeah. I cut off the lights, I go to bed and I get energized. And it's because this theory says it's because I get that rush of energy saying it's getting dark. You need to get ready for the, you need to get your work done. So if you think, if you think about that, um, what might we want to think about starting to do later in the day? Not having, not having so many lights on kind of dimming lights. Yeah. So maybe start turning out some of the lights dimming and then we'll get that rush and you might actually get the kitchen cleaned up before you go to bed, mm -hmm. um, you know, <laughs> or, or mm -hmm. something, um, but you get that kind of dimming the lights. It kind of mm -hmm. naturally prepares your brain to go to sleep and it should set us up for sleeping better. So I just found that really interesting. Does mm -hmm. that intrigue anybody else besides mm -hmm. me? Oh, yes. It, it just kind of made so much logical sense to me because I go to bed and it's like, I need to do the laundry. Mm -hmm. <laughs> no, I don't need to do the stinking laundry. I should have done the laundry four hours ago. I don't need to do the laundry now. <laughs> so, um, but during the day, there are interruptions, you know, like for my whole routine has changed now that these therapists are coming to the house and the one is occupational, the other one is physical therapy. Um, I've got to be present because he doesn't understand their instructions. Mm -hmm. And I will say it the South African way, the way <laughs> because that he can kind of follow, even though I have to demonstrate along with the therapist what he needs to do. Mm -hmm. And he, he tries to do it. And then I say, look at us, look at us. And then 
only when he looks at us and then he catches, I mean, he doesn't like to look for long, but when he does, then he tries it on his own and eventually we get him going. But I mean, so I have to do things at night because that's when I, when he's in bed, that's when I get stuff done. Yeah, that's when you can. And so, so that's the reality of your, of your life. And it, it's some information you can, you can take it and do with it as it, it makes sense for each individual. Nothing's going to work for everybody. So Melanie, yes. um, to go along with the lighting, I think a lot of times too, at night, we close the blinds and we turn the lamps on. Yes. And when we've done that our whole lives, when we need to start to wind down, even if it's still bright out, like now it'll be nine o'clock at night, it'll still be bright out. But if I can close the blinds at say seven o'clock and turn the lamps on, it's the signal to my body that we need to start getting ready for bed or calming down or whatever it is. Yeah. So sometimes we have to change the environment because we can't change the lighting outside as well. That's a good point because, you know, you're not going to bed with the cows and getting up with the cows, you know, and, you know so that's mm -hmm. kind of paying attention to that makes more sense. The other thing I think does make a real difference are, you know, the lights from screens, you know, the lights from TVs, the lights from phones, the light from iPads, the lights from computers. And I also understand that's when I get a lot of my work done. I like to get up in the middle of the night and work because nobody returns my emails in the middle of the night. And so I find that very satisfying that I can make some progress when I email in the mm -hmm. middle of the night. And then it's very rewarding, but, but it doesn't work for everybody. Um, Do you so know how to get the um, phone? Um, you know, for the blue light blocker, if you on if you have an iPhone, you press on you press the button three times, and it gives you an option color filters, and then it goes to red, and it's far better for you at night than the blue light. Well, I'm I'm gonna start doing that. So that's a, a, I'm glad you're here, Margaret. <laughs> Good. Yeah. So the next one I pulled up was let's make the kitchen more dementia friendly. Um, this is not my kitchen, although it could be truthfully. Um, <laughs> So what, what do you what do you notice about this kitchen that's not making it very friendly? It's yes. very cluttered. <laughs> it's very cluttered. And so there are lots of things to do and lots of things to do stuff with. And if this was the kitchen of a lot of people, I <laughs> with dementia, that salt would be poured into those pots and that oil would be poured into the bread maker. And there would be a lot of work going on. So the idea for this is clutter not a good idea and so using visual cues to tell people what to do so if what you want people to do um you know this would be more of a bathroom thing maybe but if what you want somebody to do is to brush their teeth and if the toothbrush is out there with toothpaste on it someone walks into the bathroom sees the toothbrush sees the toothpaste it's more likely to happen that if they walk into the bathroom and they see the, the bathroom parallel of this kind of situation. You know, so thinking about, you know, what are the, the cues here? What should I, what, what does this mean to me? So think about that. And again, I don't know why every room I looked at when I, go, when I used um, these, the photo thing, all of these rooms are so white and so pale. It's very cool or weird. This is how do we make restaurants more dementia friendly? So how many of you would like to go here and eat dinner with somebody living with dementia? Does that sound like a lot of fun or not so much? Not so much. Not so much. So I think there's several things that are wrong with this, with this, this moment. What would be wrong for this moment for someone living with dementia? Too busy. It's too busy. There, there are too many things going on. What else might be wrong? It's probably very loud. It's probably very loud. So there are a lot of people. There's a lot of noise. What else might be going on? Not a lot of light. There's not a lot of light. So this is kind of dark looking, which is going to make it harder to process. So um, someone dropped in. The world is confusing. This would be confusing for a lot of people. So that idea of how do we make, how would, so what might be, so um, I am a believer that we, we, we can provide opportunities for people living with dementia to have all of the experiences that they've enjoyed all their lives. We might have to make some modifications. 
You know, if someone always loved hockey, you, you might not take them to go see um, the Hurricanes during the playoffs if they've got dementia because it's loud and it's a lot of people. You, you might wind up taking them to go see a little kid's hockey game because it, it might not be as loud. It might not be as much going on. Maybe if you want to go to a restaurant, maybe you don't go to this bar restaurant kind of thing. What might be a better choice for um, going to a, a restaurant? What might, how might you change that to make it work better, make it friendlier? Somewhere less busy. Yeah, somewhere less busy. And so that might mean you, you don't go eat lunch at, 12 o'clock, right? Mm -hmm. That might mean you might go to a brunch kind of time or you might go, what's the, what's the parallel for brunch? Is it, is it Lupper or is it, I mean, I've heard people say, um, Leonard, you know, Leonard. Um, but, but kind of a, a early bird dinner kind of time. So you might go and off hours, what else might you look for in a restaurant experience for someone living with dementia? <clears throat> I would order take out and take it to the car and go fi find a place to sit and where we can eat in a park where it's just the two of you. So you, you might do take out, go find a pet place where you can picnic. You might mm -hmm. picnic in the car, you know, mm -hmm. so, so we might not deal with the restaurant at all. We might just, and, and, and we've got a lot more options. A lot of people, places have gotten a lot better about that. Mm -hmm. So that's a great suggestion. Kelly, were you saying something? I thought you were saying something, but I, you were muted, so I couldn't hear it. Maybe you, maybe I misread it. I was just thinking someplace quiet. You know, so some, it was yeah. maybe where they had soft music playing in the background and it wasn't so chaotic and all the lights a little calmer. Yeah, so somewhere where it might be um, less chaotic, a little calmer, some quiet music. Um, you might want to sit off to the side instead of in the middle. You might want to sit outside in, instead of inside. Um, you know, that might be louder. Um, but kind of thinking about what might those options, what might those choices be. Um, you might want your person to sit where they're not facing the entire dining room. So you, you might don't want see to a portion of it instead of everything. So you might want a booth where there's some screening yeah. of some of the things that are going on and not in the middle of the highest traffic kind of place where they can see some things, but not the whole thing. Mo, what were you going to say? I was going to say that I've read and experienced that going to early dinners is sometimes less noisy, less crowded, like have the four or five o'clock dinner instead of the six thirty, seven o'clock when it's really, you know, crazy. Yeah. So go into that, that early bird dinner mm -hmm. kind of thing might be a better choice as well. Yeah. Another thing is I like to um, suggest to friends that we do lunch in the family, we do lunch and that way we're not worried about those evening hours and what happens with the getting tired and the night time problems. Mm -hmm. Sundowning. You know. so maybe we right. have Thanksgiving breakfast in, or Thanksgiving brunch and brunch. Yeah. Thanksgiving mm -hmm. dinner. You know, maybe mm -hmm. we have our our family Sunday meal at lunchtime, middle of the afternoon instead of late at, later at night. Um, you know, the other thing that kind of comes to my mind is the idea of um, but one of the most one of the most unhappy people I've seen in my life was a lady and it was obvious that it was birth her birthday you know she had on a a corsage and you know there were balloons and it was it was obvious that this was a special moment and they they took her to the golden corral buffet now <laughs> wow mo, mo is groaning and covering her face margaret's going oh no and so why do you think they probably took her to the golden corral buffet Probably always liked it. Because it was what they used Favorite. to do. They had gone to Golden Corral Buffet for her birthday for years and years and years. And what do you think happened that year at the Golden Corral Buffet? Mm. Too many choices. Oh, too many choices and too many people and too many things to hold and to manage and just too, 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 too. So you, you might want to think about somewhere where um, you, you don't have to use a menu. You know, you know, if you go to 
this certain restaurant, this is what the person is going to like. So you don't have to necessarily use that menu for that. Um, you know, if you get go to a Medios, this is what you're going to get. And a Medios is it's a restaurant in Raleigh. It's downtown. It's kind of a classic kind of place. It might get a little bit loud, a little bit dark, and you know what you want. So, well, so I mean, we have we also have um, what we call companion cards, mm, and we have what we call mm -hmm. memory cards. The companion card says something like. My companion has FTD memory or... impairment, you know, whatever it wants, whatever you want it to say, please be patient. Yes. And then that we have another one that's for the person living with dementia that says, I have memory problems, mm -hmm. you know, please bear with me, please be patient, that kind of thing. And sometimes I think it's nice to openly give that, but sometimes too, maybe you just slip that to the hostess and the the waitress or waiter, the server, and then they know to slow down and, and expect things that maybe are a little bit different. And they're not shocked when your person eats off of everybody's plate or licks things or licks, or licks things, it's whatever. It's, mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's, that's just, it's going to happen. So if the <laughs> server knows, then everybody with us knows, then it's what happens. And I think, you know, I think when, I think we, uh, so yes, thank you for bringing those up. Um, those are wonderful. Um, I, 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 I was talking with an attorney whose parent had dementia. He said some of those made up and, and it said, um, my, my parent has dementia. Um, I appreciate your patience and I tip accordingly. <laughs> and I, I just thought that was that was just brilliant you know mm -hmm. I yeah I, I thought that was just very clever um the other thing I was I was going to add about that is um I think we as part of being friendly having a dementia friendly world is I think we have to start um accepting people living with dementia um, as part of our communities. And, you know, we aren't going to, I mean, you're, you're, you're unlikely to take the person living with dementia to the Angus barn, which is, you know, a really expensive restaurant, special occasion kind of thing often. Um, but a family restaurant or a casual restaurant, um, I think if someone has dementia and has some things that are, atypical i think we just need to find um places in our hearts and souls and minds and spirits to accept that and i think if if somebody can't my opinion it says more about them than it does about us or about the person living with dementia and and that's that's my opinion anyway but i'm biased so you reach a point when you you can't care what they think because young ones will laugh when they particularly if they see them licking the plate um i don't put my husband in those situations anymore <laughs> it's too embarrassing for him. you know so it's just how it is well because he has the behavioral yeah. variance now yeah yeah but is he embarrassed no he's having a good time he's eating no mm -mm. i think it depends on That's the person true. and the situation Mm -hmm. so I, I had a lady who was um, walking through a dining room and walked past, past the, the table where somebody had just been served their meal and they had hot French fries. And, and be honest with me, how many of y'all have ever walked past a table where there were hot French fries or hot pizza or a piece of chocolate cake or something and you weren't tempted just to grab a couple as you walked by. Mm -hmm. and, and so she walked by and she grabbed a couple as she walked by and, and kept on going. And, and there were kind of confusion and, and someone with them stopped by and said, I'm so sorry, this person has um, dementia. We, we're glad to pay for your meal. We're glad to order you another meal. And the, oh, my aunt's got dementia. I didn't need all the French fries anyway. So you know, mm -hmm. it became a way yeah. of the community. And I think it does say a lot more about them than it does about us. I want to go back. There was um, Mo said um, Medicare requires doctors to ask if there's any area mm -hmm. or throw rugs in the home. There are trick 
have, and you know, I, um, yes, um, I'm a nurse and I have fought with my mother over rugs for decades. <laughs> Um, and I finally wound up saying, um, my friend Tifa, because Tifa is part of our extended yeah. family, um, says you shouldn't have these rugs. And, and my mom said, oh, well, if Tifa says I shouldn't have the rugs, we need to get rid of the rugs. And I called Tifa and said, you told my mom she shouldn't have rugs. And she said, yeah, your mom shouldn't have rugs. So it all worked out, keeping it in the family. Um, and so, yes, we need to be really intentional and careful about rugs. So rugs need to be anchored. And so there are ways an occupational therapist can do this. There, maybe you don't do a rug. Maybe what you do is do a vinyl um, mat, mm -hmm. you know, that can be anchored mm -hmm. to the floor. Um, but there are rugs that are okay because of the texture and because they're non-skid. So there are options. But yes, take rugs seriously because Balls are is not a good plan for somebody to live with dementia. Now I've got one more picture I want to show you. Um, so we, we talked about restaurants and the next one was about um, making the barber or the beauty shop more dementia friendly. So when you look at this, what in this picture is really appealing and what might be a little off-putting or confusing? The mirrors. So the mirrors might be a little much because I've actually, and many of you have probably had this experience where the person looks in the mirror and says, well, hey, sweetheart, how are you doing? Mm -hmm. And um, has a, a lovely conversation with, and that's fine. Um, but they can also be kind of confusing because you're seeing what's behind you. It can mm -hmm. kind of get, so we might want to think about the mirrors. What, what else might be, do you like or might be kind of confusing? I like the yeah. chairs because they're reminiscent of an older barber shop. Mm -hmm. So, so I you kind of see those chairs and know what they're for mm -hmm. to some degree. I agree with you, Lisa. I think those chairs look like chairs in a beauty shop or a barber shop. And so I think that's a strength. I, however, there looks like there's a footrest in front of each mm -hmm. one which is needed once you sit in the chair, but to climb into the chair, it might create a fall risk so it I have seen those where they can move the foot rest or raise it and lower it once you get in mm -hmm. um, so that would be better I also like that there's barber poles I love the barber poles I think they're so wonderful um, mm -hmm. I put that one up there um, specifically because we make a lot of and we've got some stuff on bathing and we make a lot of mistakes with washing hair and you know, we make the mistake of when the person gets in the shower, we wet their hair and wash their hair first. And that's the one of the worst things we can do, because what happens when your hair gets wet? You get water in your face and you start to get cold. So, you know, I do the hair last and I have a number of families who um, use the barbershop or use the beauty shop because that's where people are used to taking care of their hair. And so that's. Um, something else to, to kind of consider. So we're just about out of time. I've got one more slide that's kind of a summary and might be the only one you really get when, when Lisa sends us out because um, those pictures are really hard to send. I had to break the power. I'm using a different computer. The, the sound on one of my computers isn't working and the, but the PowerPoint was on it. So, um, I had to put it into four pieces to send it to myself. So you might not get the pictures, but we might send you this, which is what makes the difference. And it's things about the environment, what you, what you see that's a positive thing, what you don't see that's a positive thing. And then what you see and don't see that might be confusing. Same thing for what you hear and for what you feel. Thinking about matching the pace and the number of words, matching the expectations so they fit with the person's abilities and are reasonable and flexible. Thinking through what are our options about time of day? What is the person thinking about for their time of life? And then a little bit on communication, which we um, have so many resources about nonverbal communication and verbal communication. And then really the last one um, that I, I think will make a difference in making our world um, a friendlier place is if we all took a few moments to make a connection before we start the work. 
you know, take a moment to make the connection before we start the task. So when we started this, um, when we started this call as strangers, you know, not, not knowing each other. And now because we've, we've spent time, we've talked because we learned a little bit about each other before we even started the call or as we were starting the call, do you feel safe and comfortable with the people on the call? Mm -hmm. yes. Yes. And so taking that moment to make that connection before we start doing the work, I think will make the world a friendlier place. This has been a fast hour. Thank y'all for, mm -hmm. for staying with us. Thank you for your questions. Thank you for um, sharing the situations that you're sharing. Lisa will be sending you out resources. Um, and I look forward to, um, oh, she just dropped the YouTube channel in there. So that's mm -hmm. the good. That's good. <laughs> I, that's will, good. I will share all this information with you, the videos, the links, everything in the email. I did want to let you know we're, we're doing monthly themes. And so the theme for all the information we're putting out on social media and YouTube this month is about dementia friendly. So we are going to have some Facebook posts with just more tips. They include some of the things we talked about with dining and some other things. Um, but so we, you can watch and we will have those online. And then also we do um, a thing called Care Partners Forum where our dementia navigators, who are the ones that you would call in and talk to if you had questions, are going to talk with someone who works in a community to help the businesses there become more dementia friendly. And so they're going to talk with someone from um, the Wake Forest, uh, North Carolina a dementia friendly group to understand more about what communities are doing or can do to become more dementia friendly as well. So there's a lot more out there That's on this. Mm -hmm. um, but thank we you all that. so much for joining us tonight. And if you thank do you. have any other questions for Melanie or comments or anything, please feel free to reply back to any of the emails that I've sent you. And I will share that with you as well.